Greetings, space enthusiast. You're tuned in to Space Forward. Get ready to embark on an interstellar expedition with forward-thinking space visionaries to explore the latest intriguing ideas that are making our space future a reality. We're your hosts, Hussein Bukhari and Kelly Kowalski. In this episode, we talk to Professor Thomas Blaschke about applications, advancements, and challenges in mapping and analyzing big Earth data. I'm always saying it is more difficult to hide something on the world now. The satellites will see you. In Greece, people with uh, swimming pools in their gardens, they were taxed. And then they're starting to camouflage with military nets. They are swimming pools not to be detected by satellites. Or there were colleagues of mine here were involved actually in a case that went to The Hague, where they were involved in uh, Sudan or uh, Darfur, where uh, whole villages were burned down and that was documented by satellite images also. Tune in now for episode 14, Advancing Geoinformatics with Thomas Blaschke. I say geographic information systems, you say geoinformatics. But what we're essentially talking about here is lots of layers of different kinds of geographic data uh, to build models and maps of our world, right? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. And uh, finding patterns or relationships within that captured data. So where is all this data coming from? Well, that's interesting, right? Because there's a few different main type of sources. First of all, there are terrestrial sources, like any aerial imagery photography that we do. Um, that's essentially how Google developed its first version of the of the maps. But since the first satellites, first out the Earth observation satellites in 1960, we've launched thousands of satellites, which essentially means that sub programs like Sentinel program by Europe or geostationary weather programs by USA. And now there's even another layer, which is brought by private companies like Planet, Capella, Spire, so many others. They have been able to launch their own private satellite constellations and they're collecting data and processing it at the same time. I know there's uh, different kinds of sensors capturing different kinds of images, optical, radar, multispectral, but What about spatial resolution? I mean, what kind of details can our eyes in the sky really see? Well, it depends, right? Uh, We're talking about pixels. It's essentially how much uh, land area is represented within that pixel. The smaller the pixel, the more the detail. So as I understand it, uh, most satellites are capturing low or medium resolution images. Um, But I've heard that some of the latest commercial satellites can see spare tires, um, even license plates or vehicle numbers on cars and trucks. Definitely right, but it'll cost you. Interesting, but I diverge uh, because it's time to introduce our next guest, uh, who is a professor of geoinformatics. He's been working with all kinds of data sets to build maps and models of what's going on on Earth. His work has helped Uh, to predict landslides, wildfires, and even risky traffic accident areas. He's mapped soil erosion to uh, human migration patterns and even fact-checking sustainability claims from the U.S. metal industries. Well, that's interesting. And? Well, according to the report about greenwashing, the good news is um, metal industry companies that are reporting sustainability do indeed have lower emissions of air pollutants. The not so great news is those companies only represent about 8% of the metal industry in the United States. Uh, So that means that we have some work to do, right? I mean, uh, but let's move on for a second. So Dr. Blaschke works on all these types of critical environmental studies, figuring out ways to build smarter systems that can gather rich, useful data about human activity on the planet. So without further ado, let's zoom in or Zoom out with geoinformatics. Uh, so today we're talking with Thomas Bleschke, a professor of geoinformatics at University of Salzburg. Um, welcome, Thomas. Really great Thank to have you. Thank you for hosting me. Um, could we start off by having you give us a brief introduction about yourself and your background? Yeah, um, I'm a professor in geoinformatics, but uh, probably need to explain what that means. Uh, most people know GIS 
geographic information systems and geospatial data and some would call that geospatial technologies but that also stretches into earth observation remote sensing so we in europe some in some countries they use the term geoinformatics so that's where i'm the field that i'm uh, working in for many years i studied that started in the 80s to, to study that and i'm now <laughs> head of department of a department that is called geoinformatics at the University of Salzburg. We're about 70 people working in that field. And we are, we are working a lot on the applied side. Um, so not necessarily uh, always new algorithms, but very much related to applications from forestry, hydrology, urban planning. We will certainly discuss that a little bit. That's great. Um, well, you already pretty much answered our first question, which was defining geoinformatics. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but just to drill down a little more, um, perhaps you can uh, also explain to us a little bit more about Earth observation in general and when when you began this work and how has it evolved since your start of your career? Yeah, I'll, I'll give a practical example. When Again, I didn't really start in remote sensing. I, I started with the GIS site. And then in, I think in the 1989, I needed data for my master thesis or so. And I ventured into remote sensing earth observation. At that time, we could manage at the university to buy a quarter of a Landsat scene because the whole scene costed $6,000. Uh, and it was magnetic type style. You had to purchase that. It came through the post several weeks after and stuff like that. And so then we kind of, um, several students creased out as much as possible from this one single Landsat scene. Nevertheless, you could do uh, very interesting stuff with that. Uh, but um, nowadays you go to, an, you, you log on to a cloud infrastructure and you have access to thousands, you have access to theoretically millions of Landsat scenes at your fingertips, uh, but you could, within seconds, you could uh, write a little script and could actually retrieve some information from several hundred images at the same time or so. I think this illustrates a little bit uh, the progress of these uh, 30 a little bit more than 30 years when I'm working with Earth observation data. It's not a very scientific answer, but maybe it helps uh, people to, to understand how dramatic the progress is in terms of computer power behind, in terms of speed, in terms of data access. Uh, that doesn't mean that all problems are now solved. So You talked about Landsat satellites, well, a Landsat scene. Maybe describe to us what, uh, when you started, what that looked like, what that process was, and now what imagery we're talking about today. Yeah. Good news and the bad news at the same time is that the very basic principles didn't change a lot. You have an array of data consists maybe uh, several thousand rows and several thousand columns, and that builds an image. And we processed that in the 1980s, and we do process this today. This is at least in optical imagery, also referring to radar data, same principle. You have a, usually a rectangle array, in, and you're processing the data. And what you process is our digital numbers. And the digital numbers refer, again, in optical data, they refer to brightness, to greenness of vegetation. They refer to reflectant values, which is basically data. We try to make information out of that. And this is a long and a complicated process. Many people think, oh, there is now AI and I just do any miracle. And then I have from the data, I will be all the way to information. Of course, today we will see that we AI is really changing the game. But again, I would say that the very basic principles of having raster cells, pixels, analyzing them, trying to understand what we see or what a radar tells us what is there or what a thermal camera tells us is there to make information out of that. And maybe maybe an extra, another aspect to that is that it's not a black box and we usually don't have only one image or a couple of images from a particular area. Today, we have so much data, we can usually also put that into context so if we know that this is this area is in a certain urbanized world and we know where streets are and we have this information 
then we don't necessarily have to treat the images as black boxes. I think this is already now almost a trend that maybe I should have not started with, but I see that remote sensing information doesn't come isolated. It comes in an, in a world full of geospatial information at your fingertips. Could you drill down a bit more on some of your research papers where we have some real-world applications of geoinformatics um, and maybe describing to us some of the projects that you found interesting or some of the papers that you found interesting where we're understanding the world better in a sense, hopefully? Mm -hmm. I uh, have to be selective because uh, I like uh, many uh, applications. In, in terms of quantity, I think many papers over the last years had de dealt with landslide detection simply because I had two or three fantastic PhD students who worked with me for three or four years. And so there is a, certainly 20 papers or so dealing with landslide detection, landslide monitoring, both from optical data and from radar. Very few actually combine so far these worlds. But here at our department, we do a lot of research for NGOs, for refugee camp mapping, in particular in Africa. Uh, this was one of the reasons why we founded a spin-off company, because at one point it worked. And then once your algorithm work. And then I'm always saying that if something works, then we are, we are not allowed at the university to proceed because then it becomes, it may become commercial, uh, even so you're working with NGOs in this case, but we, in order to be able to service them, we founded in 2015, a spin-off company now, particularly working with uh, Doctors Without Borders in this case for 11 years now, mapping refugee camps on a daily basis, basically. Wow. And so, uh, well, here's a question then to follow up with the refugee camps. Um, could you walk through what you have found from your research and, and the work that you're doing, as well as maybe where there's, um, for, for that one example, gaps, what's missing that needs to really be done to, say, improve that information or improve the know-how or improve the guidelines for for that one example? A few years ago, I would have said that it's about to get high-resolution data. High-resolution data are now, they are available, but they cost money. And when you watch the news and you watch the war in the Ukraine, you can see that, that in images, you can clearly see tanks. You can see all infrastructure in high detail. The problem here is that there is a few, a handful private companies providing these very high resolution data. So talking about less than one meter, below one meter spatial resolution of the pixels. And that causes a few problems at the moment. Firstly, you, you need to be able to pay for the data. So this is for NGOs, for instance, a problem. When it comes now to data acquisition, because, so you are ordering data for a certain part of the world, and then you are competing with other orders, and of the military usually has higher priority. So this I see as a little bit of a problem at the moment, but it's getting better in terms of the diversity of the data providers. It's not a monopoly because it's becoming cheaper to launch satellites. Or ESA for a while used the term space 4.0 and NASA calls it new space. New space means that the democratization of space in terms of lowering the costs through sharing rockets and at one point, reusable rockets and stuff like that. So lo much much lower costs for, at least for the small satellites. Generally, satellites tend to become smaller and lighter, uh, except for the big Earth observation satellites. You can still build uh, satellites with one ton, uh, 1,000 kilogram, uh, are examples of scientific satellites. But the commercial satellites, they are say, in the size of maximum of a washing machine with weights of 30 to 60 kilograms or so, up to maximum 100 kilograms. So weight, it's much cheaper. And therefore, we also see a diversification of the countries that, that are players here. A few years ago, it was basically the US, China, India, Russia, the former Soviet Union, uh, of course, uh, through ESA and some countries having additional missions. But nowadays, we also see smaller countries for the, the CubeSats and NanoSats. So going down to, you know, 30 by 30 centimeter cubes, very light stuff with launching costs of, I don't know, $10,000. Uh, universities can afford to build these small, tiny satellite so wrapping up the best data that you would that you want to have the ones that you know from you watching tv at night 
they are still usually expensive to get for larger areas. But there are now many alternatives, at least for smaller areas, at least depending on what what type of resolution, spectral resolution you want, etc. So just to, I mean, just to summarize, then the technology's there, the costs have come down. However, there sounds to me there's still much to be done in the sense of coordinating and accessibility of how that information gets processed and uh, put out to the public or to clients or to governments, military, yeah. That's true. And there there are international organizations trying to leverage or trying to coordinate, coming up with standards, trying to guarantee mm. access. There is the group of Earth Observation, and, and this, the building a system of systems, GEOS, for instance, and trying to come up with also defining the data to have like you just type in earth observation and then you would find at least the metadata and the meta information not necessarily immediately the full resolution information but you would find websites where they are well organized and data sets are organized in a way that that non-professional users may find the data i think one of the things that that i'm very curious about is the potential of future applications that that earth observation could support we know that the global population is expected to rise tremendously. That brings a whole another level of problems as much as it brings concerns. So how can we consider and evaluate Earth observation as a, as a means to support the growing concerns that we are dealing with as a human society? You know, because it's hard to explain to a common layman sometimes that Earth observation from satellites could be very useful, but it can be used with X now and Y in the future. But what does that Y in the future look mm-hmm. like? Well, very, very good question. Uh, where to start? I mean, we, we, I think we started in the past, we started with, the, with physical phenomena. This is, I think this is the easiest to understand. Uh, drying up of lakes, deforestation, uh, some consequences of climate change, uh, wildfires. These are, this is all very easy to understand. This is very intuitive, I would say, for people to understand. And then together with thermal information, we can analyze the heating up of our cities. We can map, maybe better understand urban heat islands and things like that. But what we more recently see in urban planning, the high-resolution satellite data in combination with airborne LIDAR data, whatever, we also see them being used as proxies for economic purposes and for describing economic processes. So, for instance, there are companies that are making good money from monitoring construction sites worldwide. and. Uh, it took me a while to understand what the business model is, but you know they they always tell you that in the economic crisis in two thousand seven two thousand eight there were these huge construction sites in uh, Dubai, for instance, and from within the days basically they they more or less stopped in some of the places they the construction and and uh, some of the investors and the big banking industry and insurance industry they found out if they know that maybe a day earlier than others you know that's a very useful information and it's not about it's not about this one particular building in frankfurt or in milan uh, or in copenhagen it's about having an overview of larger construction sites in the world and then having a dashboard and telling you, hey, intensity is going up, intensity is going down. And there are studies, there are recent studies that show this correlation with economic figures. And so economists are now interested in that because, okay, economists, when they say, okay, how good or how bad is our economy working, they usually have to wait until the end of August in order to tell you that the growth that, that in during August, our GDP grew or shrunk, right? And, and they are now looking into methods of kind of real-time monitoring of the economy through proxies. That's interesting. I mean, uh, you bring a very, I mean, this is essentially the cusp of innovation, right? And I think that's, that's what innovation will be useful for, is to extrapolate and to expand on the potential horizon for future applications that either economists, banks, or whoever it is that can use this for. As much as they're 
there's a lot of work that's being done. I imagine there's a lot of challenges. To you, what are some of the key challenges that you think we need to overcome to improve sort of big earth data? You know, I imagine that a key problem that we talked that you hinted on a little bit earlier, you talked about uh, is the accuracy of assessment of the images, you know, with the, the, the type of classification that needs to be done per image or per pixel even. So what are, what, what are your thoughts on challenges? I'm always saying in a lecture to students, the computer will always deliver you a result, uh, but you need to find out how good or how bad the result is. Those studying those observation programs, like we have a master program on the Copernicus Digital Earth, for instance, they will learn in detail the kind of a, a strategies. I mean, there are many data out there where that you could potentially use as the truth, but depending on the resolution, if you go for the very highest resolution, like 30 centimeter pixels, well, firstly, that's not always useful. And if you study the Amazon rainforest, it, it usually doesn't make sense to start with 30 centimeter pixels, and you would hardly find a data to, if you try to classify every single tree, to uh, compare it with something else. Um, so, uh, sorry for that long answer, but um, I'm trying to think of uh, of a short answer. But accuracy assessment, let's put it that way, requires some knowledge, usually also related to the application. It's hardly, or it's only generic knowledge, uh, technical knowledge. Where would perhaps there be data, Earth observation data, that is where it was inaccurate or faulty, um, and how would that have real-world uh, consequences or, or even harm? I'm not sure if you ever come across something like that. Um, is that a possibility? I'm, I'm sure there are some, some examples, but um, since we don't have a monopoly of data. So, I mean, if somebody doubts that these data are correct or the data are the best one that you can get, I'm not saying perfect, there's usually alternatives and, and there are more and more alternatives. But let's actually put it the other way around. I think it's we will be getting better and better. And it is, I'm always saying, it is more difficult to hide something on the world now. The satellites will see you. In Greece, people with uh, swimming pools in their gardens, they were taxed. And then they're starting to camouflage with military nets. They are swimming pools not to be detected by satellites. Or there were colleagues of mine here were involved actually in a case that went to The Hague, where they were involved in uh, Sudan or uh, Darfur, where uh, whole villages were burned down and that was documented by satellite images. Also Mugabe in Zimbabwe, yeah, when in Harare, they, they bulldozed some areas of areas where the voters were not really in favor of him. And that was documented by satellite images. So there are a couple of examples. There's even NGOs using fighting for rights for minorities, several NGOs that explicitly using satellite data to, to prove and to detect something. So though the good news here is that, of course, you can also do something bad with the technology, but I think it is more difficult for dictators to hide things. So we're living in a more transparent world for hopefully for good purposes. Hopefully, yes. But again, of course, you can... Also, use, you can use every technology for the better or worse. Yeah. So a lot of useful applications of geoinformatics. But how do scientists and researchers interpret all this Earth observation data? Well, uh, over the years, there's been a, a number of different systems that have been developed. Uh, there are computer systems, like a rule-based system. It's often used to store and manipulate knowledge so we can interpret the information within that data. It requires a set of facts or a source of data, then it requires a set of rules to interpret or manipulate that data. For example, uh, when I want to extract a specific piece of information from an image, uh, like soil salinity or license plate, uh, the rest of the data in that image is distracting to me. So I remove it and that leaves me with that specific piece of information and I find analytics out of it. Got it. So as I understand it, there's a lot more machine learning being used in these systems. Yeah, definitely. Over the last, uh, over the last decade or so, machine learning, artificial intelligence has been 
very much incorporated into geoinformatics. Uh, one of those ways is convolutional neural networks. Um, it's an artificial neural network, uh, which is mainly used in image analysis, which means that it is very apt and very useful for Earth observation and remote sensing applications. However, it requires a very, very large set of data and applies automation algorithm without the need for human involvement. And then it interprets that information from that data that we have given it. So algorithms are essentially the rules or the way to command the data, right? Yes, that is correct. And that's one way to interpret it. And another way to interpret it is that we have this historical amount of information that we have collected from the rule-based system. Now, what we have done is we have created these systems and algorithms so we can remove ourselves out so we can get more for less. Well, all righty then. Uh, let's dive in to some more geoinformatics. So we want to dive a little bit into some of the most recent research uh, about remote sensing, the use of machine learning that you hinted on a little bit, and uh, the handling of Earth observation data. You know, the rasters, the pixels, the arrays, the millions and millions of lines that come through. You know, can you give us a little bit of an overview of some of the, some of the key findings? In the general, the process that I already mentioned, from data to information. In the old days, you started with a maximum likelihood statistically classification because we always want to say, okay, oh, these pixels, they seem to be water. These pixels, they seem to be forest, and these pixels seem to be meadows, whatever. And here we see since the early 90s, mid-90s, we see now differences. There came rule-based and, and classifiers came up, and I was for particularly between the year 2000 and 2012, 13, I was deeply into rule-based, but then not exactly at the same time, but overlapping support vector machines and random forest and other type of classifiers came up. And people were enthusiastic about that. And now since a few years, we see machine learning, AI algorithms, deep learning, convolutional neural networks, CNNs. That's, that was a was and is a hot topic. And that's at the moment more or less the state of the art. But in, in cutting-edge research, of course, scientists want to go further because there's no methodology in the world which would only have advantages. So I, would, I also see the limitations of these deep learning convolutional neural networks, particularly they are data-hungry. I think everybody knows these examples where when they started a few years ago, they asked people to train, can you see in the image, can you see a cat or a dog? And then you click on dog, no dog, dog, no dog, and it's learning. And then with quite a high accuracy out of millions of images, uh, the system is able to distinguish uh, images with a dog uh, included or with no dog. And not too long ago, one of the godfathers of, uh, of AI and machine learning said that we are still in the infancy of the AI age because a human being, if you show a 10-year-old uh, kid that, hey, that this is a lake and you put it in another pl place in the world, he or she would immediately identify a lake. So it basically needs one example as a training. And we, we still need thousands or ten thousands of samples to train. Of course, there is a lot of progress. And there are thousands of papers in the direction of, of weekly supervised or semi-supervised or non-supervised learning, transfer learning, and there is a, all kind of methodologies. But I would say that the majority is very powerful, but it's still not really uh, mature. What, in your opinion, then, would be the ideal AI machine learning applications that will meet some of these challenges that you're talking about? What, what, we need, what needs to be done in that regard? We have recently submitted a research proposal and we really keep our fingers crossed to get the funding for it, where we want to bring together object-based image analysis, as we call it, where we do image segmentation and we then treat groups of pixels that are homogeneous, being that a, a tree being that a building, a pond, water body, whatever, consisting of many similar pixels, and then working with this object in an object-based world. And this is the world of the rule-based that I described before. But combining both worlds, combining the world of rule-based and image segmentation with the advantages of AI and machine learning, 
this is, of course, we are not the only ones in the world trying to bring these, to bring advantages from the different world together. But this is where one or two of PhD students and two postdocs that I'm working closely together with are deeply specialized in this particular combination. You know, you talked a little bit about some of these algorithms being data hungry. Is there enough data that is available in quality data? That's a good question. I would say until not too long ago, the standard algorithms, they were, as I said, data hungry. They needed many training samples. You had workers that would manually click on building, no building, or tree, no tree, etc. Again, we do see progress here. There are, firstly, there are, there are data augmentation techniques where you mirror data, for instance, artificially rotate them and stuff like that to create more samples. But I think the way forward is to reduce the number of samples. Here we see more and more algorithms that are less data hungry. I think this is a clear progress. Another progress in research here is that so far we were limited by the fixed size window image patches, 16 by 16, 64 by 64, and then et cetera. And also here we now see more flexible approaches coming up, but in, in trying to combine the different worlds, the rule base that I said before, we're trying to incorporate prior knowledge or knowledge that is not an image. I try to give you an example that is not so theoretical. Mm. Yeah. When we do cloud, cloud shadow detection in an image, for instance, you can have the best algorithm in the world, but it can basically sh find the, the shadows of images. But it will never, it will, well, I shouldn't say never. In the rule-based world, what we can do is we have, once we classify a cloud and we know the position of the sun, which is a metadata for every single satellite data, we can then create a connection saying, hey, this shadow here on the ground, that must have been caused by this cloud up there. And and this I haven't seen I haven't seen an AI that could create such a connection because this is almost a, a causal. It's a causal, but it's of course also a geometric relationship between these objects. And that maybe shows where it goes to. When it when machine learning now started, it started in nineteen fifties, no no question. But it when it became popular now the last ten years, and you had this dog, no dog or cat in an image. This is really brute force, ten thousands of examples, and then it finds the structure of the pixels. And with these, what I described before, with alternative techniques, they are much more clever, I would uh, say in colloquial terms. I think it's not not scientifically correct to say it's a clever algorithm, but it's a lower, it's a leaner algorithm, let's put it that way. If we can sort of uh, shift the conversations more towards a little bit more satellite focused, you know, what about data from different satellites? Is it possible to combine and merge these data sets? You know, let's say that we're taking uh, our radar data and an optical data and a hyperspectral data and merging them all together. You know, how is that? Uh, yes. well, what's the consequence of that? That's a very good question. This, this is really um, the business model of many startups that I know. I particularly know the scene in Europe. I'm not so familiar with the North American startup, uh, but being it in startups specialized on fire detection, on forestry, on, on agriculture, many of them do exactly what you describe to, to combine different data sets. But it is so far, it, it's not just drag and drop because, you know, they have different resolutions. You have different times of a day, different acquisition dates, so different geometries. Uh, radar is is a complete different data source, so it's not a it's not a reflection like the optical. That, that also is the reason why radar is typically not uh, not not being acquired in a nadir, what we call a nadir perspective, in ninety degrees or perpendicular to the Earth's surface, rather than an oblique uh, way. This is quite tricky, but again, that's that's a that's an arena where where companies can earn money if they can do this business well. It's interesting. I'm I'm curious. What about um? We know that you were involved as a mentor uh, with ESA Copernicus accelerators, um, as well as something called Digital Earths. I know I'm talking about two different things, but maybe uh, we could take it part by part. Uh, what are these initiatives and how have you been involved and how are they impactful? It's quite a mouthful there, but whatever you can tackle. 
Yeah, Digital Earth, the term was coined by Al Gore in a famous speech in 1998 in uh, California uh, when he was a uh, vice president, a US vice president. He, in this, in this, uh, it's really worth to look it up. Uh, you would also find it at Wikipedia. Um, so in this, in this visionary speech, he said, I envision a world where a 10 year old kid can basically have a virtual globe and can with her or his finger point at any point uh, in the world and can explore information at this given point very easily and intuitively, etc. So he, he described something which is, the, almost there now but interestingly with the means uh, they had in 1998 there was no technology we didn't have smartphones where we could use our fingers and wish <laughs> swipe over over them etc but in this speech i also actually know the person who wrote him this speech uh, <laughs> um, uh, that was quite visionary and that was the start of um, a, a movement called digital earth and China jumped on that much later, in 1999. Uh, they founded an international society on digital earth in, in Beijing in a, in a big event. And uh, the Chinese government spent uh, quite some money. And there is a big secretariat. I had the pleasure to organize a biannual conference. Um, but yes, there is the concept of digital earth. And again, we even use that as a name of a study a master study program here, a joint program between three U European universities uh, that we currently have. Moving uh, from digital Earth and looking at the future of space exploration, is there a potential for a digital moon, a digital Mars? You know, I imagine that a, this question has been asked to you, but will we see a development of astroinformatics? So I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm not an expert in extraterrestrial remote sensing and it's not called Earth observation anymore, obviously. But the little I know there is that there are websites like ones called Met Meta Moon and uh, there are digital twins that NASA used for instance for their you know, to plan for their rover that they brought to the Mars Perseverance, this very difficult to pronounce last mission on the Mars. This was an extremely complicated mission as far as I understand. So, I mean, for me, it's it's natural. Yes, there will be. The answer is clearly yes. As we have, as we are building now, not the one uh, digital twin of the Earth, but, you know, the European Space Agency and ECMWF and OIMEDSAT. And as alone, four or five big players in Europe trying to do that and then in North America, etc. And and the, uh, in China, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, quite, I know quite well what the Chinese uh, Academy of Sciences is, is, is doing in this field with their, their 1,000 people working in a, in a department uh, called Digital Earth. And, and yes, there, is, there will be a digital moon model and there will be a digital Mars model. I don't know if there will be ever if there will ever be a or the digital universe model. I would guess that there are, that people will try to build something like that. So perhaps we can shift the conversation a little bit from the digital Earth to a little bit more about startups themselves and you know which geoinformatic informatics startup product should exist but isn't you know on the market right now or isn't even being explored. You know, because you're in the research domain, you kind of explore concepts from a theoretical level, which have practical applications, but, you know, there nobody's out there listening to or listening about, you know, what do you believe is the next big unicorn or the next big problem that needs to be solved? Hmm. Um, if I could answer this question, I might, might, I might get rich. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it secret. So be so be careful about what you say. <laughs> no, uh, no, it's 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 difficult. Uh, to say. Also, my problem is a little bit that I'm um, looking at the the technology and the methods, and in the market they tell me, "Hey, I don't care about how you solve the problem as long as you solve the problem." So when we, for instance, we here we have a group, quite good group on uh, using um, data cubes, uh, a certain technology which tries to get, to provide fast access to multi-temporal data through in the background array databases and having kind of layer stacked 
multi temporal data okay so but you can't what we learned on the, on and and there is one one startup for instance in Austria where I'm a little bit involved now ubicube uh, that trying to to sell this data cube technology with this fast access but you can't sell the technology you need to sell the solution okay with this technology we can have we can um, quite fast uh, screen through satellite imagery and look for floodings for instance it can point click at a point and saying okay go through all the images that are in the archive and how often was this particular parcel flooded within the last 10 years and and then once they get to this point they need uh, customers and need they need to sharpen a product etc and at one point they will basically hide the technical solution from the customers this is what i ha really had to learn but uh, it doesn't guarantee that if they have a good technology that at the end they will they will also succeed in the market that's actually fascinating because you know you yourself are um, a scientist founder and have found companies at the edge of applied research yourself, you have firsthand experience of this. You know, you have over 300 scientific publications and uh, you've been listed as one of the most highly cited researchers. A recent study at Stanford University put you among the world's top 2% of the most impactful researcher. You know, so what is your secret and what is like, what, what, what keeps you going? <laughs> I like, I like, I like. I like how you're scoffing on it, but yes, please tell okay. us. Well, <laughs> there is no secret. This is uh, um, okay. What is impact? Uh, a few years ago, we were basically counting publications. Nowadays, people want to find out if uh, research matters. But I think many do the same, make the same uh, mistakes as they did with counting the papers, uh, because we don't really know the impact, and we don't really know. Uh, if, if the research matters or not, but if, but we use proxies such as how many other people cite your paper. Uh, statistically, they are right, but it's it, it's not necessarily the case in any in in uh, always. Secondly, there is a strong bias between disciplines that whereas papers are highly cited, like in medicine. I just saw the last um, impact factors of journals, and there are journals in medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, that has an impact factor of 200 or so. And then uh, people, uh, once somebody once told me that uh, the other extreme, if you are in archaeology, the highest impact factor, the best journal they had, the impact factor was 3.3 or something. Um, so that that's and to compare but that is is unfair so if you if you are a very good archaeologist then maybe like 15 or 20 or maybe 40 people may cite your paper whereas if you have if you now do some research on covid and you publish that in a, one of these good journals then it's quite likely that 500 or 1000 people will cite that it's interesting i know we're wrapping things up here um but i'm curious you know, given your job, I, I know uh, as a professor of theoretical ge geoinformatics, and I'm not sure how many times you look at Landsat images over your lifetime, but do you ever get this, um, I don't know, feeling of awe of being able to see the earth, uh, not from your chair that we're speaking from right now, but almost zooming out and looking at a wider picture, much like the overview effect that astronauts talk about? Do you ever get that sense of feeling or sense of awe? Hmm. Good question. Uh, it reminds me to when I studied, uh, I, st I started in the first semesters to study geography, classic geography. And somebody in, in uh, one professor used this, this metaphor of the microscope, you know, instead of the microscope. So trying to kind of zoom out and to getting an overview. And, and I think this, this maybe describe the idea of sometimes only, only by zooming out, you may be able to see pattern that you would otherwise overlook like if you're standing if you're standing in a wheat field in kansas you know and basically what you see is wheat or there's this is in a in a landscape ecology textbook and then you 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 have a balloon 
and you step into this balloon and you will slowly rise it and then you describe what you see okay and you see okay this is wheat fields and then oh on the horizon there is some forest patches coming up uh, and you're going a bit higher and and then oh but behind the forest patches there are another there are other f- wheat fields and and oh and then there is a little village or whatever so i mean pattern change and, and some pattern will only arise at a staying with this metaphor at a certain height this this is what has fascinated me always, but I, I'm not sure if this is really the answer to your question. <laughs> uh, well, I guess then it's motivated you, driven you, maybe, maybe uh, we hope a sense of all to some degree. Otherwise, uh, you wouldn't have chosen that topic to stick with it all these years. Oh, sorry. Was it a question? No. <laughs> no, I just commented. I was, okay. I was waiting for his say and I didn't want to talk okay. over him. He's no, like... that's perfectly okay. I think I think this has been a... A kind of a fruitful conversation, and I've I've actually really curiously tried to understand if you think that there is something that you think would be useful for our listeners to know in terms of earth observation. Okay, maybe maybe one kind of one kind of take home message or what I what I I, I like to typically to say in, in talks or so at the end um, that the technology is the one thing. But I think it's important is, is, in, is trying to teach future generations to make the best out of the technology to support decision making. And I think for that, ideally nowadays, we do need engineers and we do need technicians, but we also do need the environmentalists and we also do need social scientists. And of course, ideally, <laughs> you know a little bit from everything. Um, bright overview and, and deep knowledge, education, education, education. That would be my <laughs> message. Thank you. <laughs> so, Kelly, did you come across anything interesting while researching this episode? Well, this is uh, going to sound a little corny, but I was uh, browsing the website of Esri, which is a company that does geoinformatics, or in their ad speak, the science of where. And um, I came across a, a really cool quote by the environmentalist, John Muir. He's sort of the grandfather of our national parks here in the US. Um, and he said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything in the universe. A rather philosophical quote, um, but I think very applicable to so many things in life. Yeah. To me, I think the most interesting thing that I found during this episode was that, you know, geoinformatics isn't really global. It's actually very universal. We're going to need this when we are thinking about going on these interplanetary expeditions and adventures, you know, we're going to need a digital moon, a digital Mars, a digital Venus, because if we really think about it, you know, we need to understand what is happening in those areas. And we need to be able to use that information to make better decisions. So in the future, I imagine there's going to be a digital version of the solar system. Yeah, maybe our great, great, great grandchildren will get a version of an exoplanet, a digital ex- Who knows? Exoplanet. Why not? <laughs> Well, Hussein, it's been really fabulous hanging out with you and learning a little something about geoinformatics. So until next time. Gia Kelly, peace out.